like, you know, we're all people who kind of like to... What about your origin, sorry? My origin, <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my origin story is, uh, you can find my bio in, in various places, but, uh, yeah, I've been, I've, I've been at this uh, from the beginning. <laughs> What made you decide to use video? <laughs> uh, because I, I wanted it. <laughs> uh, so in, in, the, in the Julia world, we're all people who kind of like to, to look under the hood and see how things work. And we, we care a lot about how and why things work, and not just that they work. Uh, so in, in the interest of that, I'm, I'm doing this uh, tour through some of the internals. Um, and I hope that you can get into that. Uh, if you have a laptop out, go feel free to take a laptop out with the uh, opening terminal and text editor uh, and a Julia source tree uh, and follow along. Uh, so, so first of all, it helps to, to understand basically what exists in the language at the core. Um, you need something there so that when you keep asking how and why, there's, there are always good answers at every step. That's, it's the goal to always have good answers to why. Uh, and then eventually you hit, you hit the loop, but, but that's all right. Um, and so basically what, what exists at bottom is there, there, there's a data model and sort of code and execution model uh, in the language. Um, and so this is basically what the language specifies. Um, so you have, uh, you have bits, structs, uh, tuples, uh, ba basically, every value uh, is essentially has this duality. There are basically two parts to everything. There's some uh, bits, which is just sort of sort of arbitrary data, uh, and then there's a tag. Uh, and the, the key thing about the tag is that it's structured. It has sort of a known structure uh, and meaning and properties uh, that the system knows about. Uh, and then the code model is sort of our, our set of primitives. There are, by some counting, I, I've counted 109 of them. Uh, so that's kind of a lot. It's not something where I can say, you know, oh look, it's all based on just four primitives, or no, well, it's based on just 109 primitives. <laughs> uh, but the, the, there's a good reason for that. I mean, the, the reason there are so many is that we want to sort of be able to account for everything that could possibly be relevant uh, to practical programming. Uh, and, and one of the things that's very relevant to us is what can the machine do? So we have things in there that are essentially like an assembly language. Uh, and then there are just, just a few very simple uh, language primitives for, you know, for doing functions and control flow. Uh, and then there's this sort of third part uh, to all of this, uh, which is basically just glue. Which, and I think it really counts as a sort of third essential part uh, to the system, uh, which is basically the, the method tables and type information that sort of matches together uh, the top two halves, uh, that, that links together your, your data objects and, and your code and, and matches them up. Uh, so if you think about this, uh, the dual tag and data kind of arrangement, which is, which is very common, I, th I thought of there, there's kind of a cute way to think about it, uh, which is that in a, a language like C, you basically only have only the right thing. You just have bare data. Uh, and then in, in the other end of the uh, spectrum is a sort of symbolic system uh, where you just have uh, expressions with known structure, and it's this known nested structure that everything has. And that's sort of a lot like what the, the tags are like. Uh, that this is this is very hand wavy, but I think it's kind of a neat way to think about it. Uh, and so, and it turns out that the, the very popular systems tend to have both of these. Uh, so you know, Python, uh, other popular high level languages have have sort of both. They have this duality of, of the data part and the tag part. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the tags are usually well, and, and the data. These things are usually quite simple. Uh, like the, in Scheme, for example, the tag is actually drawn to a fixed set of things. There's maybe you know only five or seven things that the, the tag can be. Uh, or in a system like Python, the tag is basically the class. Uh, and then also usually what can go in the data part is fairly limited, like it might be a dictionary or just a, you know, symbols and lists. Uh, but we really we take it to an extreme, and we uh, have a very flexible notion of both half halves of this box. Uh, we, we want to allow flexible data representations on the right side, and then also elaborate structured tags on, on the left side. So we have sort of a lot of both. Uh, and that, that drives a lot of how the system works. Uh, so, okay, so I'm gonna start getting through some of these primitives and just sort of listing all of this out, um, just to see. So th these are all listed in boot.jl, uh, defined there and some, somewhat defined in C. Uh, so this is sort of the, the full set of what you might consider built-in types uh, for all practical purposes. Uh, there are 77 of them. Uh, they're not all completely essential. 
the main reason why a lot of them are here is just sort of for completeness, is it, it would be weird if you know, in 64 we're defined in one place and in 16 we're defined somewhere else. That would, it would be sort of an overly pedantic reduction to the, the minimum possible thing. So, so there's a little bit more in here than is, is strictly necessary. Uh, but, but these are kind of the complete set of things you need uh, to get Julia off the ground. Um, and so th that set of types basically has sort of closure properties uh, that if you, if you look at the basic properties of them, like their super types and the, and the type of them, uh, they're all closed under that. So it's this, it's this closed set. You don't need anything outside to really talk about what they are. Um, and all the code and data in the system is ultimately linked back to, to those few things. Uh, so here's either, these are sort of a picture of the links that I'm talking about. Uh, so starting down at the bottom here, this is your typical value. I have an int here that's one. Uh, and you can take the type of it, and that's sort of a link that every value has. And then you get this type thing. Uh, and as soon as you have a type, there are two links. There's a, there's a super type for a type, and then there's also type of, keeps happening, because you can type, type of anything. Uh, so once you're in this type realm, there, there are these two links uh, that everything has. You can keep following the, the super link, and you can keep following the, the type of, uh, and you get, this, uh, you get this diagram, basically, where there, there are these two fixed points, where once you get to any, it's its own super type, and once you get to this thing called data type, it's its, its own type of. So that, that thing on the left is basically self-describing. It's, it's a struct that describes it, its own layout, which is, which is not that fancy. It's perfect. It, sounds kind of, it sounds kind of cool, but it's, it's really not that, uh, it's not that cool. It's, it's really <laughs> uh, all right, so these are the kind of code primitives. Uh, that everything is built out of. So there, there are two halves of them. There are these 27 uh, so-called object primitives. Uh, these, are, they, these are all first-class functions. Uh, you can use these like any other Julia function. Uh, and they operate on Julia values. So they operate on the whole boxed uh, you know, tag, tag and bits thing together. They operate on the whole thing. Um, and there are actually there are a few too many of these. And I, there are plans to cut this down. We, we can get rid of uh, several of these. Uh, but it's basically the primitives for accessing fields of structs and parts of arrays uh, and for, uh, for calling functions and uh, throwing exceptions and all the, all the basic stuff that you need. Uh, and this, I think over time this will be cut down a little bit. Uh, these are not all super necessary. Uh, and you'll find these in, in built-ins.c. They're all defined in there. Uh, and then there, this is completely other set of uh, built-in operations which we call intrinsics. Uh, and these basically only operate on the bits part, only on the, the right hand side. Um, and so these roughly correspond to LVM instructions, uh, although not entirely. Some of these expand into multiple LVM instructions. Uh, but this is kind of our basic instruction set. Uh, which, you know, it, it, it's basically there to describe, you know, what can the CPU do efficiently. So to actually run code, uh, we go through a whole bunch of uh, translation steps. And this is, this is basically the summary uh, of all these steps. So there, there are about 11. Uh, and then each of these steps has a, a function in the system that will sort of give you visibility into it, uh, which is on, on the right-hand side. Um, so first, we parse, which is just going from a sequence of characters to structured expressions. Uh, and you can do that yourself using the parse function. Uh, then macros are expanded. Uh, you can do that by calling macro expand on the, the output of the first step. Uh, and then sort of the next uh, steps three through six uh, are basically, they're really done all at once. There isn't any separate uh, visibility into those separate steps because uh, they're, they're done together. And that's basically lowering steps that, uh, that move the, you know, the, the fancy syntax into something that's very simple and straightforward. And I'll show uh, exactly how and why that works in a moment. Uh, so then eventually this spits out something that has basically just very simple statements, assignments, function calls, and branches. Uh, you can see that by looking at the code lowered. Uh, and so then, you know, at that point we have something we can execute uh, and everything starts from top level expressions. Uh, so given a top level expression in a file or entered at the REPL, uh, it'll be evaluated. Uh, and usually part of that evaluation will involve, you know, inserting some kind of a definition. So usually something will get added to a method table uh, as part of that. That's your, your typical top level expression does that. Uh, and so you can see you can see the method tables and then search them using the methods function, uh, and then eventually when something gets called, we need to call type inference on it on demand. Uh, and we also do our own inlining and some high level optimizations. 
Uh, you can see the output of those two steps with code typed, uh, and then we do LVM code generation, and LVM takes it from there and does native code generation. All right, so we have a, I have, I have some test code here. Oh, this got all, since that got all broken up. Uh, hopefully you can read it anyway. So I, I picked this little piece of test code. I, I searched through the standard library to find uh, a, good, uh, a good test subject, and this, this worked well because it has an enormous number of, of syntax features in a really small space. So there's this, it has macros and you know it, and the chain comparison thing and you know, it had, in for loops. It, had, it has a lot of different features and very few uh, lines of code. So you can get uh, over. I have a gist with this code uh, at that short URL. I don't got the line got split up. Uh, uh, so if you go there, you will find a gist uh, that has it. And the reason I did this. Uh, is that I have a, I have a pre-stream coded version of this. So one annoyance is that I have to insert backslashes in front of the in front of the quote so that you can enter this. Uh, so that, so I, I did that for you if you if you go to visit that gist. Uh, so let's uh, let's take a look. All right. So as as everyone knows, Julia is just Lisp. <laughs> well, of course it is. That's completely obvious. You can just start it with dash dash Lisp, and then it, and then it is Lisp. So you know that's that's pretty obvious. Uh, and here you have you actually have a, a Lisp environment. Uh, I can do one plus two, and that will uh, that will that will work. Uh, so this is basically a small embedded uh, scheme like Lisp that's that's uh, linked into the system that's used to implement the compiler front end. Just because I find scheme is a really good way to write parsers and do symbolic manipulation. Can I do this essentially, uh, or is that not possible? Uh, let's see. Well, you have to be able to start Julia to do this, uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's, uh, well, okay, hold, hold that question. I, I, I don't know if it's possible. Uh, but so from here, you have a, a Lisp environment that has all the compiler front end code uh, available in it. So you can you can call various functions in there, which of course are not are not documented. I mean, I mean, just, <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? Uh, so you can do, for example, Julia dash parse. That will parse something. So if I do, do the Julia version of that, so you see that gives me some expression. Um, so we have this, the, the parsed format uh, is basically designed to just directly reflect the structure of what you put in. So it doesn't really say what it means or how it works. It just, it just sort of gives you a representation of, the, of what you wrote. So if, like a for loop, for example, you know, for i in x and so that's just going to come out as says, okay, it was a for loop, and here's the iteration spec, and then there's some block of code. Uh, so it doesn't say how a for loop works, it's just a, a structured version of that. Uh, so you can also actually, there's another way to, uh, to, to get into this, which is kind of fun. You can do, uh, so if you're at the Julia prompt, uh, and, you're, and you're tired of Julia, you can call, uh, see, call JL list prompt. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can also uh, you can also get into that from uh, from there. And then when you when you quit that, it just it just quits. But, uh, <laughs> All right. So this is I, I see this is sort of this is sort of like the road level in NetHack. Does anybody know what that means? NetHack. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it actually so, does things. Yeah, that, that, yeah that's, that's not surprising. I think this needs sort of a real terminal uh, to work. Uh, so if you want to, uh, so if you want to get started with this, you can uh, you can go in here and call Julia Parse on the, on, on this code, uh, and then you can you can you can you can get this process going if, if you want. Uh, so when you call Julia Parse, you're going to get this. Uh, so we can see it's, it's a function. It has, it has some macro calls in it. They're clearly marked as such. Uh, and so you get, you get this structured version. Can you briefly say what these things are to people who are not you know, scheme and list users? Like, what is this structure? Uh, yeah, so this, so this is the, the Lisp uh, S expression notation, uh, where everything in here is just a list uh, or a symbol. Uh, and so a list begins with an opening parentheses, uh, and then it has other things in it, and then ends with a closing parentheses. So they can be nested arbitrarily, but ultimately it's just you know, uh, simple things like strings and symbols, and then nested lists of them. 
Uh, so this is basically just a way to represent syntax trees. Uh, it's a very convenient, simple way to, to represent them. Uh, the, this, so this is not a, not a very friendly notation for programming, but it's, uh, it's very convenient when what you want to do is see exactly what the structure is. Because it's, every time there's a, there's a nesting, there's an, there's an open parenthesis. So it's, it's very unambiguous. It, it makes it a lot easier to, to manipulate these things. Uh, so you can, you can see exactly what the, what the structure of the code is. Is there a way to get this representation from inside Julia instead of the notebooks? Yes, yeah, so you can call the parse function. Just parse? Yeah. But it doesn't print like oh. this. No, it doesn't print like this. <laughs> yeah. We have ways of showing uh, the expressions within Julia that, that uses a more friendly format. And so this, so to get this printing of it, you need to do it uh, through the, the list prompt. But you can get it through the meta.s expression. And it will transform the, the Julia expert ASD into something that looks more like this. Oh yes, that's a good point. Yeah, I think what Toivo wrote that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, we can now we can expand the macros. We can actually you can you can actually see you can see the macros expand before your very eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so when so when that when that happens, you can see. So like if you look at the at the top uh, macro call there, you can see it kind of it kind of blew up into an if statement because that that's an assertion. So See, it becomes uh, an if statement and then uh, something that throws an error. Uh, and and when, we, when we parse these data structures, we, we have to kind of convert them to Julia data structures so that we can pass them to macros that you write. Uh, you can process it as Julia data structures and then we convert it back to a list of data structures actually for, for further uh, symbolic lowering. So you can see there's some that these, these uh, sharp sign Julia things are actually Julia values that are embedded in the, in the syntax tree. Uh, for example, you know, the version number is some Julia type in the macro return, so that just gets embedded in here, and then it's just treated as a black box uh, by the front end. Can you just tell them what you mean by lowered? Uh, and by lowered, is a, it, it means they're taking something that's from a more human level, something that you'd be comfortable reading, to something that is more machine readable. All right, and now, now we start running these sort of symbolic passes. Uh, and and th this, is, uh, th this, this is just these, these lowering steps that, uh, that just gradually uh, massage this thing into something that's easier for a compiler to operate on. Uh, so so there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of sort of fancy syntax that's, that all ultimately comes down to the same thing. So there are lots of ways of doing control flow, you know, while loops and if statements, uh, and 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 or. But at the end of the day, those are all just branches. So something has to convert them into that. So you'll see that. Uh, like that double and down there, that will actually at this point become an if statement. So that just gets converted to, to an if to, to normalize it. Uh, and this uh, this keeps going. Uh, yeah, so in here, this, this gets big enough at this stage that I couldn't fit it on one slide, so the, the loop part uh, is broken out. Uh, and so the loop part of it, uh, this was a for loop, and it gets lowered into a while loop, but it's this, it's this weird internal thing, <coughs> underscore while. Uh, which just means it's not the Julia level while loop. It's a more primitive uh, while loop. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a lot simpler. It has, it has fewer behaviors. Uh, and you can see there are these scope block things, which sort of explicitly delineate uh, where there are scopes. Uh, and then you can see in the, inside the while loop, there's the famous uh, for loop pattern of calling start, done, and next uh, to do the iteration protocol. Uh, so this, that, that code gets inserted at this stage. Uh, and then you also start getting all these weird uh, weirdly named symbols, that those are temporary variables that we inserted, and they have these weird, uh, you know, unreadable names. Jeff, are the S symbols in any way related to the same sort of tags that appear in the uh, uh, code LLVM output? Uh, yes, so you'll, you'll see these, uh, so some of these names get inserted at this stage, and then you'll see them later on, though they're going to survive uh, the, the rest of the steps. That's helpful to know, just because I, I at least have a hard time matching which parts of the LLVM output correspond to which bits of Julia code. So this mm -hmm. essentially would be a useful intermediate to that, is that what you're saying, basically? Yeah. It's okay, great. Uh, all right, and now, so now there's a, a kind of interesting step that takes place. Uh, where we basically want to, uh, we want to pull out anything that might do control flow into a sort of statement position. So you know, you know that you can have like a ternary operator inside a function argument. Uh, and that's very inconvenient to deal with. 
for a compiler. It turns out you don't want to be thinking about branches sort of inside evaluation of a, a function argument. You, you want to have the, the sequence of events and branches just lit, written out linearly uh, because that's more like what assembly language works like. Uh, so there, there's a transformation that's done here. Uh, this sort of pulls out all the control flow operations into, into simpler if statements. Uh, we'll also, at that stage, you have to insert temporary variables to, uh, to keep track of the values. Uh, and it's basically what you would do, you know, if I told you you could put a ternary operator inside a function argument and you had to use separate temporary variables. You know, you could do that rewrite, but it, it does this automatically. Uh, and then the final step is to sort of fully uh, flatten everything out into go to. So you can see the last couple slides were sort of very indented and nested, and this one is completely flat. Everything is flush against the left, because this is now just a linear list of statements. Uh, and everything is just go to's and labels and assignments and function calls. Uh, and that's basically all there is. Uh, so the, the reason this the reason this is really convenient uh, is that you get this you get this linear list of statements uh, and you can basically have a program counter that's just a single integer uh, that tells you where you are uh, and you know that so there there's certain things that cannot happen without changing that counter so you can't you can't modify a variable uh, basically uh, without that count without that counter moving so every every at every point in the function where you might or a variable might be of a different type or might have been assigned there's a sort of an integer number for it. Uh, and that's very handy uh, because in, in, uh, when you're doing a program analysis, uh, what, I, what we're going to do is actually uh, basically execute this non-deterministically uh, to do data flow analysis. Uh, and, and what that basically entails is when you, you run the program and when you, when you come to a branch, you don't know what the answer to the branch is because you're, you're not actually running it, so you have to take both directions. Uh, the, the way you do that is basically instead of using an integer as your program counter, you use a set of integers as your program counter. Uh, so, that, so at any given point, you're actually in a set of possible locations. And if those locations are just integers, it's very easy to deal with. So this, this representation makes that uh, easy to do. Uh, and so this is actually the exact same thing as the last slide, but this is sort of the Julia printing of it. So if you call code lower, you'll get something that looks like this. Uh, this is the, just the friendly uh, Julia version of exactly that. So you can see it's a, lot, uh, it's a lot less noisy. A little easier to read. So that, so that there isn't there isn't a um, I mean would it be worth having a way of viewing the code before it gets to go to form in, in in terms of you know at least at least that that would be a more sort of readable version of se I guess semi lower code right mm -hmm. I, I don't yeah we don't, I don't expose every every one of those intermediate steps right uh, it, it tends to be kind of big and nasty and, and very very nested. Uh, so it's, it, I don't find it super easy to, to work with. Okay. Uh, so, so at this point, we have something that we could actually run. Uh, so I, could, I have a quick question on that last slide. Why is there a go to, go to seven on line six? Uh, yes. So, so it turns out that when you uh, when you have real code and you just do this, these naive transformations of you know of ifs to go tos and loops to go tos, you end up with lots of redundant labels and lots of redundant go tos because uh, there there are often many different program points that will end up going to the same place, and so you have you know, you'll have labels piling up at that point and you'll have redundant uh, redundant things happening, and you also have things like if uh, if statements that don't have an else part, so they'll be sort of zero code at one point, uh, but there could be code there. So this this doesn't do anything very smart. Uh, it just it, it has the privilege of just generating the naive thing because LVM is very good at, at cleaning up you know, redundant branches and things like that. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, all right, so, so at this point we have something we could run uh, and it's, it's going to get passed, uh, if, if, you're, if you type this in the REPL or, or read it from a file, it's going to get passed to the uh, top level evaluation machinery, which is in this file, toplevel.c. Uh, and then there's actually uh, there's a small interpreter, uh, interpreter.c, uh, which basically supports the entire language except for the bit-level intrinsics. Uh, because those are, those are basically defined in terms of LVM, so it's difficult to run those without just generating LVM code. Uh, so the interpreter doesn't handle those. Uh, so if it encounters one of those, it will actually send it off to the LVM compiler to run. But otherwise, it will try to run it itself. And then the interpreter is just there to save uh, to save time on generating native code for every single top-level expression. Because a top-level expression that does something really simple, like x equals two, you know, we don't need to generate native code to, to do that. Uh, so it just there's a simple interpreter to handle that. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's the method sorting process in, in gf.c, which handles the method cache and uh, method sorting and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, okay, so when a, uh, when a method is inserted, uh, we do a lot of that. Uh, there's this sort of very crucial piece of machinery uh, known as the, the method cache, uh, which, which is there to solve uh, two major problems with our, uh, our, our famously complicated uh, dispatch signatures, uh, which is that uh, uh, the full dispatch behavior is very complicated, so searching for the right method is very slow. Uh, and also, we, as you probably know, we specialize functions for different argument types, and you might do too much of that. So if, if you have a function that has, you know, that takes any number of arguments of almost any type, you can have a real combinatorial explosion of, of specializations for different types that we have to avoid. So, so this sort of solves two of those uh, problems uh, by intercepting uh, new method calls. So the, the, the solution to the first one uh, is basically to only support a subset of the type system. Uh, so basically the method cache just stores uh, very simple concrete signatures. So it will just store you know, int int, and then all you have to do is see if the, if the types you have just match that exactly. And usually, matching a type exactly, you can basically do with a pointer comparison. So that's very cheap. Uh, but it doesn't support uh, the parameters and abstract types and fancier uh, aspects of method signatures. Uh, so, so first, we try to look up something in the cache. And if that fails, then we fall back to the slow procedure. And then we'll end up inserting something in the cache for, to handle it in the future. And that's pretty effective. Uh, to solve the other problem, uh, during that process, when we're about to insert a uh, method into the cache, we do, we do this thing called widening it. Uh, which basically is we, we look at it and we decide if, if this comes from a family of, of signatures, you know, it, it implies that there would be way too many of them. Uh, so basically, if you have, usually this happens when you have a var args function. Uh, so if we see, you know, you have something that has dot, 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 uh, and it's being called with, you know, signatures of just, you know, every possible combination of things, then it's going to say, okay, I can't specialize for all of those. So it's actually going to, uh, instead of inserting, uh, inserting different entries for every concrete signature in the method cache, it will, it will come up with, uh, it'll basically compute a slightly larger type uh, than the one that it sees and, and hoping to sort of catch all future similar things. Uh, and so then it will actually add, insert a slightly, uh, a slightly bigger type as the, as the entry in the method cache. Uh, so, that, so that's kind of a heuristic process. So there's no, there's no one right way to do it. Uh, so there are various uh, heuristics in that file that sort of, sort of decide uh, whether to specialize for things. Okay, and then so at the point where we insert something in the method cache, we also call type inference at that point. Uh, so this is basically the, the type inference algorithm. This is, this is almost right from the textbook. This is the classic uh, max fixed point data flow algorithm. Uh, you can see uh, at the top there I have uh, an int set, and that is exactly the set of integers I mentioned before. That's basically the, the abstract program counter that keeps track of the set of locations. Uh, you could be in, and this this is pretty much an interpreter. It just runs through the code and, and simulates it, uh, except that when you take a branch, it takes both directions and adds and adds a location to the integer set and iterates through it, uh, waiting for the type information to come out to converge. Uh, it's basically running the program over the type domain instead of over the value domain. So it's every every operation produces a type instead of a value, uh, and it basically finds all the types that can flow to every part of the code. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but uh, but but it's there. And, and that happens at the at the point where you're creating the special if you're kind of like uh, creating specialization. Okay, so here, uh, so as part of that process, basically when we encounter a method call, which are you know which are all important uh, to the language, uh, there's a compile time version of, of method lookup. It's the given uh, given some inferred types which might be imprecise. Uh, we need to find the possible method matches, and so this is. This is done by one of my secret internal functions that I don't want anyone else to have, which is, the, which is this underscore methods, which is not exported. Uh, so there's the methods function, and then there's also this base dot underscore methods. Uh, so there's an example here. Uh, so, so in this case, say I have a call to copy bang, uh, and the arguments, I know the first one is vector of int, and the second one I only know that it's a vector, uh, and then the last argument is actually a limit on the number of matches to return. Because if there are too many matches, it just takes too long to, to process all of them. So we, we don't want to. 
uh, and then you and then you get back the set of matches, which is a little bit uh, a little bit complicated. Uh, it doesn't just give you a method; it gives you some other information. So. Uh, in this case, so in this, this matched the definition that handles two vectors of the same type. So you can see it, it gives the sort of the matched type signature and it can actually fill in the type of the second one uh, because the signature implies that they have to be the same. Uh, so this is sort of the matched signature and then over here uh, it gives the basically the, the values of uh, the values of method parameters that were inferred. So, so it found that T uh, in this definition is in 64. So that information is there, uh, and then the rest of it is just the, the method object, which is what you would get out of the normal non-underscore uh, version of the, the methods function. Uh, so that's, that's what we use uh, internally during type inference. All right, and so if you, uh, if you call code typed on this, on this thing, then you will get this. Um, no, actually, I, I misspoke. So, you, so I actually, uh, when you call code type, it actually does both type inference and uh, our other high-level optimizations and in learning. Uh, so I actually had to just go in there and, and modify it to, find, to see the version that's only type inferred and has nothing else done to it, uh, which we normally don't expose because you normally just want to do both. Um, so this, this, this basically is the same as what we had before, uh, except there are types on things. So there are these colon colon things uh, that tag uh, the tag expressions with types. So it's just the same except that everything has a type on it. Uh, and then, then we pass it to our further steps. Uh, here you can see, so some inlining has happened here. Um, so let's see. Uh, so we can see, you know, in, in here there are still, uh, there are calls to things like less than or equal to, uh, which is just a function call. Uh, and we can see after this gets inlined, there's, this actually is going to be inlined to uh, a direct call to one of those intrinsic things, uh, because less than or equal to is defined to, to run one of those intrinsics. Uh, so those will, those will get inlined in there. Uh, this is just the rest of it. Uh, okay, now then this gets passed, uh, passed off to the LVM code generator, uh, which is in basically in these four C++ source files. Uh, and so if you, if you look through that, there's sort of a few, uh, few key concepts to pay attention to. Uh, you'll see a lot of references to box and unbox of things. Uh, this, this is something that code generator is really obsessed with. Uh, basically a boxed value is something that's heap allocated and has the tag as part of it. Uh, and, the, and the unboxed version is basically just the bits part. Uh, so sometimes we have a uh, value internally as a pointer to a boxed heap allocated thing, and sometimes we have just the raw data out of it. So a lot of times, for example, we want to be able to just load the raw data and then just work with it as raw data without the tag uh, hanging off the manipulate it that way. And then sometimes later, we might have to box it again. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on. And then some, some very important data structures. Uh, there's, this, there's this code context thing, which basically is it's a structure that tells you everything about the, the function that we're currently generating code for. Uh, and then there's a var info, which tells you everything about a given variable. Uh, in that function. And so that has uh, a lot of analysis results of uh, the things that we've discovered about that variable. So we can, we can look at its properties. Uh, the sort of really, the really important functions, I guess, are, are basically emit function and emit expert. Uh, an emit function sort of uh, goes through a function body from, from top to bottom and, and generates the code for it. Uh, it's, it's broken into about 18 steps, each of which is labeled. So this is a kind of really long, nasty function, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, I, of those 18 steps, pretty much only one is actually generating the code. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of stuff that ha has to happen uh, along the way. Um, one of those is dealing with GC roots. So we don't have, a, we, there, LVM has some good ways of dealing with GC and GC roots, but we actually don't use them. Uh, we, so we're not doing this optimally, but it's, it's, a, it's in a way that works and it's pretty simple to do. Uh, we have basically our own uh, thing called the GC frame, which is basically a, a stack allocated uh, set of locations uh, inside the function that we can store values in. Uh, and when that function is called, that, uh, that structure of values is basically linked onto a global chain that the garbage collector traverses. Uh, so anything that's allocated and might be held onto across an allocation, we need to put reference to uh, in that GC frame inside the function. Uh, so you'll see references in the code generator to, to GC rooting things, and that will be storing things into that, uh, into that frame. Uh, and then emit expert is basically called for every sub-expression. It, it just handles all the possible cases of what an expression can consist of. Uh, 
And then so the, those 27 uh, object primitive operations basically are also implemented redundantly in the code generator. Uh, and so there's this init known call function which has a case basically for each of those and knows how to generate custom code for all of those in various different cases. Uh, so, those, so those things are sort of, uh, the, the reason why you want very few of them is because they're so important that they're implemented at least two times. So they have a sort of a, a generic implementation uh, that you can call through a C API, uh, and they're also implemented in the code generator, and they're also kind of implemented in the type inference process, because we have to know about all their properties with respect to, to types. Uh, so, so keeping that set small is, is important, because those, those things are very heavily implemented. Uh, let's see. Okay, yes, and so there, there's also some uh, Julia to LVM type system translation that happens. Uh, so there's a LVM type to Julia, and Julia type to LVM. Uh, function that will basically just produce uh, an LLVM type given given into the one, uh, and we have you know, we have some mapping in that. You know, there are some decisions that we just make, like some some tuples uh, become vector types, some tuples become structs, some become array types, and we just we just pick something to do. Uh, and so that that's actually my last uh, slide. So I'm pretty much done. I'll take questions. Spent. So it's it's interesting. It's kind of equally split between uh, between our code and LLVM's code. Uh, so about about half the time is our type inference and generation of LLVM IR, and the other half of the time is uh, LLVM uh, native code gen and LLVM optimizer. So it's about half and half. And do you think that's a reasonable split, or do you think things can be improved? Uh, I think it's reasonable. Uh, probably the stuff we're doing could be more efficient. Uh, I, it's safe to assume. <laughs> What's I also? Uh, intermediate representation. Yeah. Uh, do you plan to extend syntaxes of the language for the new features? Uh, the syntax? Or? Yeah. Uh, so we, we try to avoid adding new syntax. Um, the, the core language is evolving, though. It's, uh, it's evolving slowly, but it is changing. And so the, actually the, basic, uh, the basics of the data model from the, the first slide are actually going to be, get a little bit of an update. I think, in, in the next version. Uh, it can be improved in, in various ways. We also got an update once before, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so when we, when we introduced uh, the immutable types, which was uh, a year year or more ago, so that, that was kind of the last big revision of that core data model. And there, there is another one coming, I think. Uh, and SIMD types might actually be a part of it in some way. Uh, we might start using the, the tuple arithmetic that, that Arch showed, for example. Uh, that's something we'll very likely do. And that'll involve some pretty <coughs> changes. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, LLVMs and the garbage collection, that doesn't in any way interact with sort of, uh, does it allow static analysis of, of temporaries and things like that? So yeah, you can, you can basically, there's a way to use LLVMs knowledge of where values are located to locate the roots uh, for the garbage collection purposes, which is much more efficient because you don't need extra space for them. You can just use them wherever they are. Oh, I um, see. But, but it won't necessarily, so for instance, let's say you have a function which allocates a temporary for, uh, you, know, for uh, you know, for some computation, but then that temporary is not passed back to the calling function. Um, I mean, there are essentially these two ways to handle the cleanup of that object, right? One is, is through standard garbage collection and either the current one or the coming one. The second one is to do static analysis on the code and discover that this temporary you know, doesn't need to persist beyond the configuration that function and just Yes, so actually so the data flow analysis that we're already doing actually is, is very well suited to that. So we can oh, find where variables are dead. Okay. Uh, so something that's sort of on the to-do list is to insert something that marks you know, where we know a variable is dead. And yeah. at that point, we can call a routine that tries to free it, basically. I see. Okay. So I think we'll do something like that. And that should then decrease the you know burden on the, the standard garbage right? collector. Yes. Yes. Maybe I mean, yeah. yeah. vectorization, the vectorized cores work much faster. Is yeah. that yeah. Work? Yeah. Uh, if, if you know that it, it has kind of like that limited lifetime within the context of that sort of function call, can be stack allocated, or do you still have to? Yes, potentially. So we, we do a little bit of that right now. We, we stack allocate some things, uh, but we don't do it for arrays. Uh, arrays are a little more difficult because they're movable, uh, but it, it could be potentially done as well. Yeah. 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 
So a quick feature request. Is there a button I could press and get a nice diagram of the whole architecture? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Yes. Don't push this. Some diagram. people really want to look at this stuff like that. And actually, you know, wait for Kenno's talk, I think, is my answer uh, to that. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess I have a question sort of related to thinking about data array and things, which is, is there a mechanism by which in the future a type system could be better for very simple unions? So I know, especially Simon Cornwall that said this over and over again, which is uh -huh. if you were to say, this is a type T union and a type, there's really only two paths that could be taken, but yes. as far as yeah. I can see, Julia right now just treats it like it was any. That's correct. Yeah, we could do a much better job of that. Yeah, if, as long as basically right now, anytime we see a type that's not just a simple concrete type, we basically just completely give up. Uh, so we could do a lot better with that. Uh, yeah, it would, it would be very cool to, to support something like that. Doesn't that restrict like how many types you can actually look at because you're blowing up the exponential increase in the number of types in the union? Yes, so that's that's the downside of the, the union type thing, is that in, in full generality, you, that thing could get exponentially long. Uh, so, uh, so we don't allow that, actually. And if, if a union uh, during inference gets too long, we just widen it. We just say any, basically, uh, at a certain point. So, but you know, uh, there are certainly cases where you know that something is definitely just one thing or another, and there there aren't an exponential number of possibilities. Uh, and those are pretty important cases, so I, we could probably handle that better. So one question I had was like, there's a couple magic numbers in, in the system where like you can bring it, like you, the number of types you look at before you give up yes. and stuff like that. So where are those? <laughs> yes, there's some there's some there's some magic numbers. Uh, let's take a look at. Them. So there. You know, to, to my credit, they're actually clearly labeled at the top of the file. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some, some limits here in, in type inference which are kind of arbitrarily chosen. Uh, where, so here, so you can see, so there's a max type union length, uh, there's a max type depth, a max tuple length, a max tuple depth. Uh, and so as we're constructing types during type inference, if things get bigger than this, we try to collapse them back down to prevent types from getting too big. Uh, there, there, there have been uh, a couple times in the past where there was a bug uh, where the type inference was basically constructing an infinitely large type and it just kept hanging. It was just hanging because it, the type it was considering kept getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so you have to kind of go through and find all the cases where that can happen and make sure it doesn't happen. And so these are some of the arbitrary limits that, that we enforce in doing that. Question about the the widening uh, during the bit, like you know, general specialized code. Mm -hmm. So does that mean just like to understand what's going on? Uh, when it, does that mean that the the code that's being generated is being generated like kind of to accommodate oh, yes. that wider type? Yes. Uh, and not kind of like the fully specialized type of what it's going to call yes. for. Yes. Yes. And then the heuristic for when it decides to do that widening is that based off of like anything about the runtime of like actually how you're calling it or is it just based on the signature of the, of the method? Currently it's only based on the signature but it, it should be smarter. Right. It would be really neat to, to make it smart enough that it could actually somehow look inside the code and see like what would be profitable to specialize on and what would be. That would be really, really great but we don't do that yet. So I imagine like, like sometimes I, I think like, there are times when I'm probably call, you know, I'm calling these methods that have like a type signature that could you know be that yep. could have a lot of different but 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 I'm but I'm only using one particular one and I'm using it a lot you know so like being able to specialize on that one would be really nice. Yeah, so there there's some there's some tricks for that. <coughs> if you use uh, if you use method parameters, the things in curly braces, mm -hmm. uh, we, that sort of forces us to specialize on, on things because okay. we need to know the, the values of those of those parameters. So that you can use that to kind of force it to, to specialize. But yeah, some very occasionally people people get bit by those heuristics. All right. Oh, look, there's one more. Um, just between you and Davis, and I, I don't understand. So I love the new fact that you can inline functions that have a if statement in them, for example. But I don't really fully understand the what are the heuristics for deciding when something should be in line and when not. Is it possible to summarize those things real quick? I'll let Jameson answer. I will try. Um, the best slide that you showed would be like just looking at code uh, type, I think is usually what it runs on. Well, actually, let's look at, um, uh, let's just look at the, the Oh, yeah, itself. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's, so, this, there's this inline worthy yeah. function. The yeah. <laughs> inline worthy is where most of the magic happens. Before yeah. that, it looks at a few things and says, I can't inline that function because it's too complicated and it just, it's not worthwhile. Um, 
eventually gets to this inline worthy function. Um, I've renamed the variable such so just cost. Uh, cost is just assumed to be greater than zero. Um, so that I can do division on it. And this is what decides whether a function is worth inlining. Um, it's a relatively simple heuristic that essentially says if the function doesn't have more than a few lines of code, and those lines of code aren't very complicated. <laughs> um, Here's it all up, right? <laughs> it's really hard to look at a piece of code and find out why it did or did not get inlines. Um, you can call inline worthy on an expression, compute the cost, and see how much you'd have to reduce the cost in order to inline that thing. But you kind of have to realize that if you just give it a quoted expression, it's not similar at all to what this function will see. Because um, this function sees it after the code lowering step and after the in uh, code inference step, which can change a lot of the expressions. It'll uh, change the multi go to statements, uh, add along variables potentially, uh, add some type assertions or remove type assertions, adding <coughs> inline code, removing inline code. Um, the inliner happens recursively, so you start with the lowest level and it will inline everything into itself and that one will get inlined into the next function fetches. So eventually that function goes to the point where it's not going to be inlined anymore. Um, Would there be a way to have some kind of macro for when you know you definitely want to inline something? There's a pull request open. I mean, oh, there's a pull request open. You can see it's commented out there. It's, yeah, it's actually pretty much implemented in here, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but if you uncommented that line of code there and yes. you wrote a symbol of inline as the first thing in your function. Um, I think it's a quoted inline, not a variable inline, but it would inline your function, just returns true and always does it. <laughs> so it's not terribly hard. Um, the inliner knows what it can and cannot handle, so if inline worthy says that it should be inlined, it will inline it. Yeah, that's a fun exercise. Go in there and try uncommenting that and rebuilding and see if, see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> but it used <Right>. to work. <laughs> uh, if you really wanted to, you could even shorten it a little bit and just like do if body.args is a symbol and the symbol is in line since that symbol's not in return position. Like I think, I think this, the symbol should be banana. I think this. <laughs> 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 I would really like a keyword. <laughs> I think we got to move on to the, yeah. the core team panel. Yeah. Thank you.